Prime Minister Winston Churchill arrives at the Canadian area in Germany for a tour of inspection. General Simmons, second Canadian Corps commander, conducts the party. On a gun sight, the PM fires a 9.2 heavy against German positions. The dauntless leader receives a grand welcome from Dominion troops. Churchill tanks are used as bleachers. Men of the Highland Division and their pipe band are out in force to greet the chief. In the bleak days of 1940, who would have guessed that in 1945, England's Prime Minister would be eating spam and chips in the heart of the Siegfried Line? The foothills of the Apennines and the vast expanse of Lombardy Plains have guarded for centuries the smallest and most ancient republic in Europe. The motto of San Marino means liberty. Its crest has seen the struggle of many contending armies throughout the ages. Legend has it that in the fourth century after Christ, a stone cutter from Dalmatia established on the sheer cliff a community of Christian masons. They were engaged in building the walls of Rimini. They established the republic which has ever since been an independent state. Canadians on leave pay it a visit. The Regent's Palace houses two Captain Regents, chosen every six months. They supervise a unique form of democracy. Only the heads of families vote to elect the government of 60 councillors. Kesselring's discarded guns are mute reminders of the German occupation in World War II. The neutrality of a little state meant nothing to Jerry in his titanic struggle for northern Italy. The San Marino militia is composed of 175 all ranks commanded by a colonel. The retreating Germans, callously disregarding international law, attempted to use one of the three towers as an observation post. The gallant little band of militia denied them the use of the turret. From here on a clear day, the high ground of Yugoslavia is visible. The Lilliputian state defied Napoleon, saved Garibaldi from pursuing Austrians, and in this war gave shelter to 70,000 refugees. Once again, its flame of freedom, democracy, enhances the world's torch of freedom. In Italy, human mascots supplant animals in the soldier's favor. The Westminster Regiment adopts John Simicelli. John's home was in Cattolica. He now accompanies the regiment as interpreter and chore boy. Another company found Gino in a shell hole. As his whole family were dead, he was adopted. Gino is very proud of his uniform. His stripes are awards for his progress in speaking English. A potential new Canadian citizen is Honorary Corporal Gino Brigelia. In full native regalia, a Holland hornblower heralds the start of an important drive. The good people of Nijmegen are out to collect all they can for their not-so-fortunate countrymen. Anything in the way of money, food and cigarettes is cheerfully accepted by the fair canvassers. Their good friends, the Canadians, are asked to help. At a wireless camp, the basket is well filled up. The gifts collected in Nijmegen will be a godsend to those Dutch families who have suffered from the effects of total war. It's time for the face-off in Maple Leaf Gardens. Before a crowd of 11,000 fans, the Chicago Blackhawks tangle with the Toronto Maple Leafs in a clean-cut, crowd-pleasing tilt. Crowding Chicago Nets are many new names and many old stagers in big-time hockey. Kennedy breaks up a Chicago power play and sails down the ice to score for Toronto. All during the season, the Blackhawks and the Leafs have been battling it out. Going into the playoffs, Montreal Canadiens keep their edge with Detroit second and Toronto third. In the last period, the Hawks break through, but fail to score. The Leafs hold their advantage as the bell goes to end the game. Toronto 8, Chicago 4.
In Canada, the Army Air Survey Wing makes a vital contribution to Allied victory. Here, the soldier student is taught the ancient art of map making by means of all the modern methods. By using air photos, the potential map maker learns to distinguish topographical features such as mountain peaks and shorelines. Instruction is given in how to transfer these photograph features to readable map terms. With the use of instruments, the students line up distant control points to find the exact position of a plane table on the map. With this instructional background, the map maker prepares accurate, detailed maps of invasion areas from aerial photographs. Thus, the combination of optics, drafting, and mathematics plays an important role in charting the blueprint of victory. A surprise visit is paid to the Canadian front by a group of Russian officers. They see first-hand demonstrations of Canadian equipment. Among the group are Major General Sus Leparov and Dragoon. Accompanied by General Krerar, they inspect machine gun sites of the 1st Canadian Army. Joining Krerar's Navy, they witness the use of the amphibious vehicles which have played such a vital part in the advance through flooded areas. A deep impression is left upon the visitors by the superior equipment and the efficiency with which it is handled. Both jaws of the trap are fast closing on the Nazi wolves. Self-propelled guns of the 1st Canadian Army open the offensive for the Hochwald Forest. Again, British and Canadian troops of the Allied left flank break into a Nazi cordon of steel. The performance of Caen is repeated. Striking southeast from Cleve against terrific artillery and infantry resistance, the town of Kalkar is captured. Under cover of darkness, the German task force holding the town has withdrawn. At first light, British troops move in to find a cowed and fawning populace. They want to make friends, but our troops will have no part of them. The no fraternizing order is well observed. A German ammunition dump goes up in smoke as our armor advances toward the Hochwald forest. From well-prepared positions, crack German units put up fanatic resistance. Veterans say the fighting is even fiercer than Fellas. In the forest, the Germans try to hinge their last northern defense line between the Maas and the Rhine. Throwing in every available reinforcement to prevent a link-up of the Canadian 1st and the American 9th Armies, the enemy is slowly pushed back. Soon, nothing remains but German dead and knocked out Tiger tanks. The Hochwald is disinfested. Jerry limps back to his Gethsemane in the basal pocket. Grim paratroopers are bagged by hundreds. Some are meek. Some are the most arrogant types yet seen by the Canadians. But their swanking days are over. From concentration camps, they will hear of the last feathers falling from a molting Prussian eagle.